The following program is produced by the Living Church of God. Every one of us, it seems, at some point in our lives feel a need for change. We feel disappointed, discouraged, or even depressed. Maybe we escape death in a dangerous accident, and we're moved to think more deeply about our life. Maybe we come to the point where we're seriously upset at our behavior, our sins, and we want to reform. Possibly you may even want to respond to God's love, His mercy, and His calling to repent, and you want to totally change your life. At such a point, the Bible tells us to repent and be baptized. Should you be baptized? Stay tuned. Tomorrow's World The Living Church of God presents Dr. Roderick C. Meredith Richard Ames Bringing you the good news of your future in tomorrow's world. This week, Richard Ames asks, should you be baptized? And now, Richard Ames. Warm greetings to you all. There comes a point in our lives when we face a monumental decision for our future. We come to a crossroads, and we realize that we need a dramatic change from our selfish, worldly, and sinful routine. At such a point... Some of us in the past responded to an emotional religious appeal without any objective examination of the facts. Many have expressed that emotion by walking down to the altar. Others have been sprinkled ceremoniously with water. And many others have followed the biblical example of demonstrating their commitment and faith by baptism or immersion in water. On today's program, we'll discuss the question, Should You Be Baptized? Many years ago, I attended a gospel crusade. It was a huge crowd in a baseball stadium. I had somewhat of a religious background, but I felt uncertain and uncommitted. Well, the preacher came to the point in his message about making a commitment. According to the preacher, if I made a commitment at that moment, I would supposedly be saved. But if I waited and really thought about my actions, it might be too late for me and I might burn in hell forever. Well, I stood up and made my emotional, on-the-spot decision for Christ. But was that true conversion? No, it was not. You see, the preacher didn't even refer to the biblical instructions. On the day of Pentecost, when the New Testament church began, the Apostle Peter plainly instructed his listeners in the most basic steps toward conversion. Acts 2 and verse 38, Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The act of baptism is an outward demonstration of faith and belief in Christ's sacrifice. By following the instructions of Christ and the apostles, one is acting in faith and obedience to God. Both repentance and faith are required to receive forgiveness and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Peter said, Repent and be baptized. And Jesus said to repent and believe. Turn in your Bible to Mark 1 and verse 14. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Note what gospel it was. The gospel of the kingdom of God. And saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. What are the two basic requirements? One, repentance, and two, belief or faith. And that faith is demonstrated by baptism, just as Peter instructed on the day of Pentecost. Let's look at what faith is. How is it defined in the Bible? Do you have this kind of faith? Hebrews, the 11th chapter, and verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is an assurance. But can you be assured of something you are totally guessing about? The New Revised Standard Version translates it, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. How does one come to acquire this faith, this conviction, this assurance? Verse 6 of Hebrews tells us this, But without faith it is impossible to please him. 
For he who comes to God must believe that he is, or that God exists, as other translations have it, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Notice how else you can have genuine faith. Romans, the 10th chapter, and verse 13. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Genuine belief, the belief and the faith that leads to salvation, comes through the gospel, the good news. Have you even heard the true gospel? If you've listened to this program at any length of time, you have. But even then, we challenge you not to take our word for it, but to prove the truth from your own Bible. Read here in Romans how you can have faith. Romans, the 10th chapter, and verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. It tells us in John 1, and verse 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ was the word of God in the flesh, and the Bible is the written word of God. As you read the Bible, as you test and prove the Scriptures, you begin to have real faith, real conviction and assurance. Be sure you read this book every day. Even just a chapter or two each day will help teach you God's truth. Now, should you be baptized? Not unless you've heard the gospel of the kingdom of God, and not unless you truly believe the gospel. You need genuine faith, and that faith must also be able to answer two other questions, as we've seen. One, do you believe God exists, and that He is the God of the Bible, the Creator of all things? Question two, do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? We've given you ample evidence in our programs and literature to help you prove the truth of these questions to yourself. The Bible is the inspired Word of God. As the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, or all Scripture is God-breathed, as it states in the NIV. Now, a third question you need to answer. Are you willing to live by the gospel and obey it? Are you willing to live by every word of God, the Bible? Remember, Jesus made it very plain and simple in Luke 4.4 and Matthew 4.4. He said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. I hope, my friends, you have a desire to change your life. I hope you have a desire to be baptized. But you need to know what you're doing. And you need to prepare for baptism and prove all things. To help you understand about water baptism, we'd like to offer you our free booklet entitled, Should You Be Baptized? Listen to the introduction, quote, Perhaps you have already been baptized as a child or even as an infant. You might not even remember the event. Is your baptism really valid and acceptable in God's sight? End of quote. This booklet will help answer that question and many others. This information will really help you in your Bible study. So pick up the telephone right now and request your free copy of Should You Be Baptized? This informative booklet is yours absolutely free. No cost, no obligation. If you call this toll-free number, 1-800-934-5579. That's 1-800-934-5579. Or send your request to Tomorrow's World. P.O. Box 501304, San Diego, California, 92150. With this offer, you will also receive your free subscription to Tomorrow's World magazine, full of timely articles and unique insights on today's important issues. No cost, no obligation to you. Call today. In the first part of our program, we discuss the two basic requirements to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and forgiveness of sins. As Jesus stated it, repent and believe in the gospel. And as the Apostle Peter stated it in Acts 2 and verse 38, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
Yes, repentance and faith are required. And when you act in faith, demonstrating that faith by water baptism, God will bless you with the awesome forgiveness of sin. Or as the Apostle Peter stated it, you will receive the remission of sins. You'll then be under grace and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You then become a new creation in Christ to walk or live in newness of life. You'll experience a tremendous change. God's Spirit will empower you to change your life, to overcome the nature of selfishness and sin. You'll be greatly blessed. Now, many preachers teach contrary to the Bible that you don't need to be baptized. All you need to do, they say, is give your heart to the Lord or just make a decision for Christ. Is that what the Bible says? Or does your Bible emphasize the need to be baptized? Just what is water baptism as demonstrated in the Bible? Let's take a look at our example, the one whose life we're to follow, that of Jesus Christ. Turn in your Bible to Matthew 3 and verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. Now, let's notice a couple points. First, Jesus never sinned. So why should he be baptized? Jesus said, to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus set us an example to fulfill all righteousness. As it tells us in 1 Peter 2, verse 21, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. True Christians will follow the example of Jesus Christ and the apostles. How important was Jesus' baptism? Jesus referred to his own baptism to demonstrate his authority to teach in the temple. He had overthrown the tables of the money changers, and he cast these men out of the temple. Shortly after that event, when Jesus was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders challenged Jesus' authority. Mark 11 and verse 28. And they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority to do these things? But Jesus answered and said to them, I will also ask you one question, then answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. These critics refused to answer Jesus because they knew Jesus' baptism testified that his authority to teach was from heaven and not from men. Now, notice another significant point about Jesus' baptism. We read in Matthew's account that Jesus came up from the water. He'd been immersed in the Jordan River. I remember seeing one artist's depiction of Jesus' baptism. It showed Jesus standing in the Jordan River up to his knees, and John the Baptist pouring a cup full of water onto his head. My friends, that's totally illogical. If biblical baptism were by pouring from a cup, neither Jesus nor John would have to get soaked to the knees. The purpose for going down into the Jordan River was for Jesus to be genuinely baptized, to be immersed, to be put totally under the water. The Greek word for baptize is baptizo, which literally means to dip or to make fully wet. In other words, to immerse. The Apostle Paul describes the symbolism and method of baptism in Romans the 6th chapter and verse 3. Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Total immersion into a watery grave symbolizes our death. Coming up out of the water symbolizes our resurrection. As Paul said, so we also should walk in newness of life. Baptism marks the formal commitment to become a Christian. This act of faith marks a major change and transformation in one's life. As Paul goes on to say in verse 6, Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. 
For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Yes, the old person, the one whose human nature exemplified selfishness and sin, is symbolically buried in baptism. Two other chapters in the Bible, Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3, also exhort Christians to make sure that the old sinful man remains dead. As it tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So, as we've seen, the biblical method of baptism is by total immersion. Notice this admission in the Catholic Encyclopedia. Quote, In the Latin Church, immersion seems to have prevailed until the 12th century. After that time, it is found in some places even as late as the 16th century. Infusion and aspersion, however, were growing common in the 13th century and gradually prevailed in the Western Church. End of quote. Yes, the biblical method of baptism is immersion, not sprinkling or pouring. Notice one other example in John, the third chapter, John 3 and verse 23. Now, John also was baptizing in Enon near Salem, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. John was baptizing where there was much water, deep enough to totally immerse those who were baptized. Now, some would still argue that you don't need to be physically baptized. All you need to do is make a commitment in your heart. Well, let's understand that a commitment with your heart and mind is required. Jesus even spoke about that serious commitment in Luke, the 14th chapter, in a section we refer to as counting the cost. Again, we ask the question, what is the source of your belief? Is it the traditions of men or the teaching, instruction, and example of the Bible? There are many New Testament examples of baptism for newly committed Christians. Because of our limited time, let's just look at a few examples, and you can read the full accounts later. How many were baptized on the day of Pentecost? Acts 2 and verse 41. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. 3,000 people responded to Peter's Pentecost admonition to repent and be baptized. In Acts, the eighth chapter, God inspired Philip to preach Christ and the gospel of the kingdom of God to the Samaritans. Acts 8 and verse 12. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. We might note here that children were not baptized. Only adults who fulfill the requirements of repentance and faith should be baptized. Little babies are not old enough to understand the need for repentance of sin. They're not old enough to realize the need of genuine faith in God and the sacrifice of His Son, Jesus Christ. But Jesus did take little children in His arms and He blessed them. Apostolic Christianity follows that example today. Jesus did not baptize little children, but He did bless them. Who else was truly baptized in the New Testament? Read in Acts the 8th chapter. Philip was led by God to baptize the treasurer of Ethiopia. While riding in a chariot with the Ethiopian eunuch, Philip explained to him Isaiah's message concerning the Messiah. Acts 8 and verse 38. So the Ethiopian commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Saul of Tarsus, who later became the Apostle Paul, was also baptized. That's Acts 9 and verse 18. The Italian centurion in Caesarea was called by God. When Peter was preaching to him and those in his house, God poured out the Holy Spirit on these Gentiles, just as he did to the Jewish disciples of Christ on the day of Pentecost. So now, with this awesome miracle of God, and with this commitment of Cornelius... It would appear from human reasoning that since these Gentiles were now converted, there would be no need for baptism. Is that true? Absolutely not. What did the Apostle Peter command be done? And note the word command, Acts 10 and verse 47. 
Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him, that is Peter, to stay a few days. There are many other examples for which we don't have time. So just how important is baptism? Turn to Mark, the 16th chapter, and verse 14. After his resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples and emphasized their mission. He said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. That's just how important biblical baptism is. Now, one more very critical question remains. We'll discuss that question in the conclusion of our program. But first, I'd like to offer you a free copy of our vital booklet, Should You Be Baptized? This booklet will give you the biblical references and principles to help you decide whether you need baptism or not. If after studying this booklet, you feel the need for further ministerial counsel, we have ministers located throughout North America and various locations around the world. You can request counseling at that time. This free booklet will help you in your personal study of the Bible. So be sure to write or call today for your free copy of Should You Be Baptized? This informative booklet is yours absolutely free. No cost, no obligation. If you call this toll-free number, 1-800-934-5579. That's 1-800-934-5579. Or send your request to Tomorrow's World, P.O. Box 501304, San Diego, California, 92150. With this offer, you will also receive your free subscription to Tomorrow's World magazine, full of timely articles and unique insights on today's important issues. No cost, no obligation to you. Call today. Now, there's one more vital question we need to answer. How do you know if you're ready for baptism? We've discussed the need for genuine faith and the need for total commitment. What most preachers do not discuss in their altar calls to just come as you are is the absolute need to repent. On the day of Pentecost, the Apostle Peter's preaching convicted his audience. Their way of life, the way of sin, had required the death of the Messiah, the Savior, to pay for their sins, and of course for our sins and the sins of the world. They came face to face with their sins. Acts 2 and verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, many preachers would like to change Peter's response. They would have Peter saying something like this. You ask what you should do? Well, you don't need to do anything. Just come as you are and publicly pronounce the name of Christ. Is that what Peter said? Absolutely not. Peter said you must do something. One, repent, and two, be baptized. What is repentance? The Greek word is metanoeo, which means to think differently or to feel compunction. In the practical sense, it means to turn around and go the other way. You've been walking in the way of sin, and now you turn around and you start living God's way through the power of the Holy Spirit. You start living by the Bible and the Ten Commandments. You repent of sin. And what is sin? 1 John 3, 4, sin is the transgression of the law, in the King James Version. It takes courage to examine yourself and ask, how have I sinned against God? The Apostle Paul looked into the mirror of God's law, the Ten Commandments, and discovered he was a sinner. Romans 7 and verse 7, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. Paul was convicted of sin, and he desired to change his life. Do you desire to change your life? Do you want to come out of a sinful, selfish, and worldly way of life? Then ask God for the gift of repentance. Ask God to show you your sins, and ask Him to help you to turn around from your sinful life. Read Psalm 51. That's David's prayer of repentance. He'd committed adultery with Bathsheba, and plotted to have her husband Uriah killed. David repented bitterly, and his life was changed. 
Repentance is basic to becoming a genuine Christian. Your Bible makes that very plain. Now, some of you might be saying, but I've been good all my life. I don't have anything to repent of. That, my friends, is a very dangerous statement. Even Jesus, when addressed as good master, answered, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. That's in Matthew 19, verse 17. And remember the rest of the story, how the young rich man who asked the question was unwilling to depart with his possessions in order to become a disciple of Christ. Remember, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's in Romans 3, verse 23. So if you don't think you're a sinner, have the courage to ask God to show you your real nature, because all have sinned, you and I included. But if you think you're righteous, then you should not be baptized until you really see yourself, your sins, and your human nature. Jesus came not to save the righteous or those who thought they were righteous. The Gospel writer Luke records the account of Jesus calling Levi, or Matthew, to follow him. Levi made a great feast in his house for tax collectors and others. The scribes and Pharisees who considered themselves righteous complained to Jesus against his disciples. Luke, the fifth chapter, and verse 30. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered and said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. If God is calling you to repentance, take the next step of seeking God in a personal relationship with Him. Pray for total repentance, forgiveness, and faith. Read your Bible daily and understand this wonderful truth as pointed out in Luke 15 and verse 7. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. May God guide and bless you in your study of the Bible and as you deeply consider the changes you need to make in your life. Next week on Tomorrow's World, Dr. Meredith will continue with the biblical characteristics of genuine Christianity. And he'll explain how our world has been deceived in following the traditions of men. You'll want to tune into this series on Tomorrow's World, so be sure to join us again next week, right here at this same time. The informative booklet offered on this program is yours absolutely free if you call 1-800-934-5579 or send your request to Tomorrow's World, P.O. Box 501304, San Diego, California, 92150. Be sure to visit our webpage at www.tomorrowsworld.org. The preceding program was produced by the Living Church of God.